but if you don't, I'm 28, I'm unmarried, no kids, single, and something on my heart and mind is marriage, and you know, it's looking for a spouse, and what should I look for? Because that's the question. What should I look for in somebody uh, to get married with? Not what does the world think I should look for, or what does John think he should look for, but what does God say I should look for in a spouse? And so, with that in mind, I went to Proverbs, and I hope to share some of that with you uh, tonight. But it's not merely a selfish sermon. I'll tell you why. Uh, the Oklahoman, the newspaper, in 2021, they wrote articles about where Oklahoma is in different areas. And in 2021, in September, they said Oklahoma is 18th in the marriage rate in our country. 18th out of 50 states in the marriage rate. They are second, or we are second in divorce rate. So when we think about the issues of marriage and divorce, uh, and our country being a problem, it's not merely our country, it's our own backyard. I mean, this is a big issue in Choctaw, in Oklahoma City, in Elk City, wherever. It's, it's something that's around. And what's very interesting about it is if you look at the statistics, the divorce rate has declined in half since 1990. The divorce rate has been split in half. You think, that's great, that's good news, not many people are getting as divorced. And that kind of tricks you a little bit because the reason the divorce rate's gone down is because people have stopped getting married. The uh, highest number that's growing in our country is not married. That could be multiple things. That could be uh, hookup culture. They choose to just hook up with people and that's it. That could be they choose to live with someone they're in a relationship with before they're married or instead of getting married. And it might be that they simply choose to not get married. They don't pursue it. And I don't think it should surprise us that generations of people who are growing up in broken homes are then establishing broken homes or they're avoiding marriage. Uh, you know me, I'm a kid who came from a broken home or a divorced home. And divorce is a real fear that a lot of young people have. It's, that's not to shame anyone in here who has kids who had to experience that, but it's just something you think about. I, I don't want to get divorced. I don't want to end up like that or have that happen to me again. So you maybe are hesitant to get married. And once again, I don't share what we're talking about right now to shame anybody. I know if you're divorced in here, when you got married, you never said, I can't wait for two years when I get divorced. You never said, I do, and I can't wait to say I don't. That was not the plan. Uh, I know that. When you uh, got married, you probably had a picture of your life in mind, and I know it didn't turn out necessarily how you thought at the time. And I, to be honest with you, I'm very sorry. Um, we all are, and we feel for you, and we love you. Um, and we, so we don't share, share this to shame you, um, but we share it to say, hey, this is a, a, de a deal. It's an issue in our community that we need to talk about. Figure out how we can combat it. There's a lot of things the church can do. We can do marriage seminars. We can have marriage classes. We can try to fill people with all the tools in their toolbox when it comes to being married. But I think one way that we can help with this problem that maybe we don't do enough is help people understand what they should look for in a spouse. Uh, if you're a football fan, you'll get this reference, but we need to play a little prevent defense. You know what I'm talking about? How about before we're in a real bad spot? Let's talk about it. And so I want you to turn in your Bible to Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs 31. I don't know if you're surprised or not that we're going there uh, tonight, but just a few truths that I saw in this text for me that I want to share with you. A few things. Um, if you're in here tonight and you are a teenager or a young adult, this lesson is great for you because you are in or quickly approaching this season of marriage. So this is great truth to listen to and apply to your life. So please pay attention, maybe take some notes. If you're a young adult like me, it fits, obviously. Um, if you're a married couple and you're thinking, well, this is my either A, chance to tune out, or B, I need to find a new spouse, that's not the message tonight. Okay, you made your choice. That's great. Stay committed. Um, maybe the question for you is, as we look at what we should look for in somebody, is am I being that person? So as we talk about this, instead of saying what I should look for, it's, okay, am I being this kind of person? Uh, parents, please pay attention to this. Uh, you have a responsibility to show and teach this to your children. I don't know if, if your parents sat you down and said, hey, here's what you should look for in a spouse, but we should do that. It, it helps our kids 
uh, start and create healthy relationships. So parents, listen to this, and as you have kids, your kids grow older, teach this to them and show them what this looks like. And if you're divorcing here, like I said, I, I'm sorry that things didn't work out. I really am. Um, I, I feel for my parents all the time. I had to witness that. But let me tell you, you have a powerful opportunity to be a witness to the truth of what you should look for in a spouse. You can bring some experience, history, some relevance to this. You can talk to people and say, hey, this is really true. I've experienced it. Let me tell you. And so you have a powerful chance to witness to some of this truth. So I hope you won't tune this one out uh, just because, you know, you were divorced or, or whatever that might be. But Proverbs 31 is where we're looking. And I'll also say this. I'm going to clarify this. And I want you to repeat after me. My spouse will not be perfect. Proverbs 31 sounds like the perfect woman, doesn't it? I don't know, ladies, if you read this and you go, I don't know if I could ever be that person or that woman. I know it's, there's not a you know Proverbs 32 for men, but it's like, she sounds perfect. That person doesn't exist. Okay, if you're looking for the perfect person, you will be single the rest of your life. Just, just going to be blunt with you. If you're looking for the perfect person, you better hope that other person's not looking for the perfect person because you're not perfect either. All the married people are laughing tonight. What's up with that? It's like you know. You will not find the perfect person. There are some things you should absolutely look for and have standards. Having no standards, bad. Having too high of standards, bad. Either way, you're not going to have a successful relationship. You'll either never be in one or you'll probably never find a great one. So you're not going to find the perfect person, and that's okay. But there are some things you should look for. And so I just wanted to start with that. But look at verse 30 of Proverbs 31. There are two truths we're going to look at, and the first is this. Uh, we'll read the verse first. Proverbs 31, verse 30. Charm is deceitful. Beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. First point, if you're taking note. Look for a spouse who is beautiful, spiritually. Look for a spouse who's beautiful spiritually. Notice what he says about physical beauty and looks. He says, charm, okay, that refers to this, when he's talking about his wife, that refers to her form, her elegance, her favor, to her appearance. And he says, charm is what? Deceitful. It lies to you. I used to lump this line in with the next one, thinking it was poetic, and, and both of these were trying to uh, just make the same point. Um, but maybe what he's saying here is charm is deceitful because, well, let me put it to you this way. Have you ever met somebody that you thought was just beautiful? I mean, attractive, they look nice, they look great, and then you met them, and you're like, you know, they're not as attractive as I once thought they were. You ever met someone like that? Maybe you've heard that phrase of... Uh, they were really pretty until they opened their mouth. You know, maybe that's part of the reason he says charm is deceitful, because you look at the outside appearance, the physical appearance of someone, and you make this judgment about how great they are. But you have no idea about what's inside. You have no idea about the character and the mind and the attitude and the heart and the spirit. And so he says charm is deceitful. It's possible that you can be incredibly good looking on the outside and you're not very good on the inside. And he says, look, it lies to you. Physical appearance lies to you. It's, it's a mirage. You know, it's, you think something's there, but maybe not really. So he says, one charm is deceitful. Notice the next line. Similar, but somewhat different. Beauty is vain. It's fleeting. It's temporary. Um, we know this, how I looked at 16 is not how I looked at 26. How I look right now at 28 is not how I'm going to look at 40. How I look at 40 is not how I'm going to look at 60, and we can keep going on until I'm six feet under the ground. Things change, don't they? It's funny, some people, we, we call it, they glow up after high school. Some people glow down. I don't know however you want to describe that, but the point is, it fades. Your physical appearance will not stay the same. It's that beauty, it's, it's momentary, it's fleeting, it's passing. So if you put a lot of stock into physical appearance when you look for a spouse, he says, hey, that stock's going to crash. Okay, that stock will crash one day. So maybe it shouldn't be the number one priority when we're looking for somebody. But notice that, that final line in verse 30. But a woman who fears the Lord 
is worthy to be praised. It talks a lot about fear of the Lord in this book, and maybe you've touched, it, touched on it already. Solomon started this book by saying, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and fools despise wisdom and instruction. He says, A woman who fears the Lord is worthy to be praised. Uh, the vast majority of people today, uh, my belief, the vast majority of people today are looking for somebody who is beautiful, but not beautiful spiritually. It is the number one priority to find someone who is attractive to them physically. Someone that they look at and they think, you know, wow, that looks great. But I'm not sure if spirituality and spiritual things are priority number one. This verse goes against the thought of the day. I know many of you in here are not necessarily on a lot of the devices and social media and apps that uh, young people are on, but trust me, if you are on any of that stuff, if you are up to date with content on di different forms, you will see it. The number one priority in finding someone is, is physical looks. And that's, that's not what God, God puts as number one. Uh, Satan has done a fantastic job of getting this world, and all of us included, to believe his lies. He is the father of lies for a reason. And some of his lies have to do with attraction and beauty. Uh, the word love and lust, they are different words, but we use them sometimes wrongly, interchangeably. I love chocolate cake. No amens there, you know. Um, no, I love chocolate cake. Do I really love that, though? Or do I lust after that? Because when I say I love it, you know what I mean? I want to indulge that. I want that. That tastes good. That would be good. Give me that. And I'm afraid so often we say, I love my boyfriend, or I love my girlfriend, or I love so-and-so. And what we're really saying is, I want to indulge that. We're not really talking about love. We're talking about lust. We have those words very confused in our society. And this is what he's addressing here. If your idea is finding someone who will satisfy or please your flesh, that's not what covenant love is. That's not what covenant love is. That, that's not what's going to bind people together for life and marriage. And many of you can attest to that better than I can. That just physical attraction is not strong enough to just last forever. There's got to be commitment and a greater promise and something that holds yourself with this other person together. And so we have a big issue when generations are raised thinking that physical beauty and attraction is the biggest key. And it's funny because at the same time, generations have wrong ideas of what sex, intimacy, relationships, and beauty even are. Um, we live in a hypersexualized society, don't we? Uh, I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. <laughs> when I preached this in Choctaw in preparation for this, I had like a funny guy. He's like six years old. His name's Gabriel, and he looked at his mom apparently during the sermon and said, Mom, if he says sex one more time, uh, I, I laughed very much, so I'm just warning you. Um, our society, sex is king, if you haven't noticed. I mean, just think about last month and what was all over the news and in downtown. But every, everything, sex is king, and our culture has found a way to not only take sexual things and put, put them in pockets everywhere, but then they've also perverted it in so many ways. Uh, every other advertisement is sexual. You ever notice that? Uh, sex sells. Uh, clothing, cars, potato chips, it doesn't matter. They find a way to use sex. Remember Carl's Jr. a decade or so ago? Just to sell a burger. They had a very terrible ad on TV. And that's normal. That's normal today. Uh, our social media is filled with sexualized content. You know, anything you look at for more than a second... Those social media sites then, they take an algorithm that says, oh, you looked at that a little longer, so I'm going to feed you more of that. So even if you look at something and say, oh, that's terrible, it thinks you like it, so it gives you more and more. And so when you see perverted things online or, or revealing things online, guess what it sends you more of? So our social media feeds are filled with that. Uh, hookup culture is the culture. How many of you had to call the person that you wanted to date or marry to talk to them? How many of you met in person? That's crazy. I don't know what that's like in my day and age. Um, today, dating is, is now dumbed down to there's an, essentially an app, if you didn't meet someone in person, and you look at their picture, 
and there's a little bit of bio they can write about them, and you swipe left for no, or you swipe right for yes, and if we're being completely honest, many of these apps, it doesn't matter what you write, it just matters what your picture looks like. And that's dating today. It's built in a way where physical beauty is the only thing. And if you don't understand that, go ask a young person, and they'll help you understand that. Not saying all apps are hookup apps. Some are just trying to find genuine people, but there are some out there that simply... Who do I want to indulge? And it's, it's not good. You know, of course, pornography is everywhere. And you see this whole society. Does it surprise us that marriage is defiled, divorce is rampant, sex is perverted in a society where all of this is normal and it's consistently in front of young people's eyes? Shouldn't shock us. And so he says here, look for a spouse who's beautiful spiritually. And in a world where physical is number one, we have to change our eyes, change our priorities, and and work on our hearts to say, I'm going to look for something beyond the physical. Look for something that's much more important. There are many qualities and characteristics that are far greater than physical beauty. It might be the first thing we notice, but it shouldn't be the only thing we notice. If that's where we start and stop, that's not good. Uh, by the way, tonight I'm not telling you to go marry someone who's ugly. Uh, that's not the message either. I'm not saying if you are attracted to them at all, that's a bad sign. That's not, that's not the message. Um, but it shouldn't be the main characteristic. One question we might ask ourselves if we are in this season in our life is, how attractive are they spiritually? How attractive is this person spiritually? Uh, do they fear the Lord? Do they have a high view of God? Do they serve Him in their life? Do they show his characteristics? Because he says the beauty of one who fears the Lord is everlasting. It's always worthy of praise. It's not fading. It's not temporary. He says find someone who fears the Lord. Instead of focusing on physical chemistry, make sure that you're focusing on spiritual and emotional compatibility. Um, Marriage was not designed for happiness. It was designed for our holiness. I'll say that one more time because that's not what we think. Marriage is not designed for our happiness. But when we are looking for someone, what is the one question we get asked about them? Do they make you? And they do, for a time or so, maybe. But that's not the end goal of marriage. God created it. and his, his, Yes, it was to fulfill something in you that you were missing or longing for. But the goal wasn't just, hey, this is going to make you happy. It was to be more like Him. It was through covenant and committed love that you would lose self, deny self, and learn to, know, learn to know what the love of God is more like. And that you can pour into someone else in the way that God has, in a way, poured into you, and you can grow into the image of Christ. It's meant for holiness. And so, if we are in that stage, or if we're teaching younger people about this stage, tell them, look for qualities and characteristics that aren't deceitful, fading. Look for a heart that loves and longs for God and who's faithful to him. If you look at this passage, and we, we didn't read it, but there are many verses that give us this idea of these qualities that are more than physical. Like verse 11 and 12, he trusts her, she does him good. Verse 13, she works with willing hands. Verse 15, she rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and maidens. Verse 16, she considers a field and buys it. Verse 20, she opens her hand to the poor and reaches her hand to the needy. Verse 25, strength and dignity are her clothing. And verse 26, she opens her mouth with wisdom and kindness is on her tongue. Those are not physical characteristics. Those are spiritual things that he is praising over and over again. When beauty fades, these things don't. So he says, look for them. So when it comes to looking for a spouse, are they attractive spiritually? Do they love God? Do they have a heart for him? Do they give themselves to God's calling? Do they seek His wisdom and instruction in their life? Do they show the fruit of the Spirit? Do you see that? Because charm is deceitful, beauty is vain, but spiritual beauty is not. So, point number one is look for a spouse who is beautiful spiritually. And I hope that resonates with you. But then secondly, look at verse 11. Okay, we only had two points tonight. Verse 11, read that with me. He says there, the heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. There there was a lot of little things I kind of pulled from this text. There's other texts in Proverbs that would answer this question pretty well too. 
But I found this verse, I think, to be more important than maybe than some of the others, or just I thought would make a good point, but it's look for a spouse who is trustworthy. If I had to boil down what I want to look for in a spouse or what I should look for in a spouse, it's spiritually beautiful and trustworthy. As King Lemuel speaks on an excellent wife, his first statement about her is she's trustworthy. He trusts in her. His heart has no lack of gain. And you say, well, why does he trust her? And the next verse tells you or indicates somewhat of why. She does him good and not harm all the days of his life. But throughout this proverb, he shows or he describes what his, how his wife is a woman of integrity and character. Whether it was her actions or her words, how she handled her money or responsibilities as a mother, in numerous ways he highlights her character. She's trustworthy. What a blessing it is to be married to somebody who's trustworthy. Uh, there's a lot of married people in here. I'll give you another chance to get brownie points. What a blessing it is to be married to somebody who's trustworthy. Yeah. Maybe you're, I'm like, I'm like, are their spouses trustworthy? Maybe not. Uh, what's a blessing to not have to wonder or worry all the time about how they will interact with other people or the opposite sex or how they will handle things. And of course, not perfect, not perfect, not perfect, make mistakes as they will, but trustworthy. You can trust them when it comes to them at work or around people or with your children or how they handle the situations that will arise in life. You can trust them. And that's important because marriage is built upon what? Uh, when you say your vows, you promise to be a faithful spouse. I, I'm still a young minister. I've only done one wedding. Thank you to Rod for doing the counseling because I don't know what I'm talking about half the time. I did two funerals and the one wedding I did was for two people in this room. Uh, Ethan and Madison and you know you said those vows together and vows don't mean much do they if you aren't trustworthy I could tell you I do I promise in, in sickness or in health and good or bad for worse or better whatever it is and I say I do and you look at me and you go I don't trust you at all my words don't mean much do they getting married to someone that you don't trust is not a good look and it's not a good idea uh, marriage is built on trust so we should find somebody who is trustworthy. If we're going to make a lifelong commitment based on trust and faithfulness, we should look for somebody who exhibits those in their life. We don't need to wait to see if they're trustworthy until after we say, I do. Now, you're, you're not going to know everything about your spouse. I know for some of you in here, you learned some really weird things about your spouse after they got you got married and you lived with them because they seem like a pretty normal person until it came to what temperature they wanted it in the house or how many blankets they use. It, but seriously, there's a lot of things you didn't know, and they didn't know about you. And those things could have changed your mind, right? But you made a commitment based on trust. So if you're going to make that commitment, find someone who exhibits it before you say, I do. You'll never know everything, but you can see it. You can see some of those qualities. And granted, you might pick somebody who is trustworthy and who is spiritually beautiful, and they can still change. We can't control everything in life, but we can see somewhat of if they're trustworthy. You know, if your potential spouse struggles being honest, that might be a red flag. Little or big things, it might be a red flag. If your potential spouse, if you can't believe their words wholeheartedly uh, because they're shady or they lie or they're manipulative, those might be some red flags. And I, I talk with some of my friends who've their marriage was short-lived, and they're like, man, there were so many red flags, but I didn't see them. Or it's, I didn't truly pay attention to them because I was so caught up maybe in other things. And we need to make sure that we're finding people or trying to that are trustworthy. That's one reason we, we value the spiritual over the physical is because those don't fade. If I can put it simply for you, a Christian, you should marry a Christian. I know people have different views on that, but I'll tell you, Christian, you should marry a Christian. You should find somebody who is faithfully living for Jesus, and that's someone you should be interested in. If they can live faithfully for Jesus, they have an even, even greater reason to live faithfully to you. Because when you're faithful to Him and you're committed to Him, that changes your commitment to your spouse. Uh, it, it just adds to it. You know, marriage is going to have plenty of ups and downs. It helps to have somebody 
committed with you that sees marriage and your commitment the way Jesus does. It just helps. It does. Uh, and, and you guys can amen that more than I can. It's, it's a blessing to have somebody who understands this isn't about just being happy, but it's about being holy, who understands it's, it's a covenant, who can look beyond the fluctuation of feelings and say, I'm committed. Things come and go. They come back. They leave. They come back. But I'm committed. Uh, plus, with a Christian, you can share every part of your life. Is this not, and I don't mean this is in this building, but is your walk with Jesus not the best or most important part of your life? Don't you want to share that with somebody? Like that's got to, some of you may be going through that. And I'm not saying you can show the love of Jesus staying committed, even if they don't love Jesus. But don't you want to be able to share that in your relationship, that walk together, that goal in life, the, the beauty and joy that comes from Jesus, the self-denial, all of these things. And so look for someone who's trustworthy. And I would say look for someone who's a Christian. Uh, that would be my advice. Uh, there are some big questions I think that we should ask, or at least I'm trying to ask myself as I'm in that scene. And, I, and there's, there's more wisdom in this passage, but we're going to sticking to those two for the night. But there are some questions I, I'm trying to ask myself. Like, one, will this person help me get to heaven? It is not their responsibility, per se, to get me to heaven. That's my own. Um, but will they help me get to heaven? Like, is this person going to wake up with me on Sunday and try to pull me back into bed instead of going to service? Is this person going to discourage me from studying and praying and discourage me from the church and being active in my family? Or are they going to encourage me to do that? Are they going to become a hindrance to me obeying Jesus, or are they going to become a help? Some questions we need to ask. Another one is this. Will this person help me raise godly children? Once again, parents, it is not 100% upon you to get your kids to heaven. Jesus is the only person who can do that, and they have to make that decision for themselves. It is your responsibility to shine Jesus in every single way in your home. It is your responsibility to raise them in the Lord, but they get to make that decision. But one big factor of this is, is my spouse going to help me do this, or are they going to be the opposite? It's just tough when you have one spouse who's, hey, you know, here's the story of Jesus. Here, here's all of this. I want to encourage you to do these things with me. I love the church. I love serving. And here's the try to share with them the knowledge of God's word. And then you have another one who wants nothing to do with it or who pulls them away. Like I said, some of you may be in that boat and I, do the best you can. There, God can still work in wonderful ways. And, you know, I, I have that somewhat of a situation in my life. And it doesn't mean your kids are going to be lost for sure or anything like that. But it does make it more difficult when one spouse says, hey, I'm all in for Christ, and the other one says, I really want nothing to do with it. It can just be difficult. So think about, hey, do they want to raise children the way I want to? Once again, I would imagine your spouse doesn't agree a hundred thousand percent on everything you want to do when it comes to your kids. I would imagine you were raised a little differently than they were, and there might be some subtle differences there. But on a general way, do they want to raise kids in the Lord? Do they want to help raise a godly home? And those are questions that we need to ask. Um, I know in here there's some people in this season of life like me who are here in this single person. I know for the majority of you, you're already married. Once again, don't go look for another spouse. Please don't go download a dating app tonight and start swiping. <laughs> Be more focused on the kind of spouse you are. I know some of the things I just mentioned might not you, you might be saying well that's me I don't have that help in my life or you know maybe this is it's like I wish I knew this 15 years ago you just do the best you can today uh, is the message but why this is so important is because the greatest decision you will ever make outside of being a disciple of Jesus is who you will marry it's the greatest decision it's the most important decision that we will ever make therefore we should apply his wisdom when it comes to finding a spouse you will not find a perfect person, but you can find someone who is beautiful spiritually and trustworthy. You can find somebody who will walk with you and help, get, help try to get you to heaven and your family as best they can. Well, if you're like me tonight, who, and you're not married, and you have the desire, uh, I'll tell you this. It's better to wait and marry the right person than marry the wrong one. I'll be honest. 
sometimes in the church we are so pushy to get people married that we encourage them to maybe make some bad choices. I want to see all the young people get married, enjoy that happiness. Of course, I want that for myself one day. But I don't want to be so pushy with them that they feel like they are missing out on life if they don't have somebody. Or that they can't walk with Jesus if they don't have a spouse. And because they can still live a wonderful life and do a lot of great work for God. And Paul says some things about that. But it's better to wait and marry the right person than marry the wrong one. I know as you scroll your social media, you feel like you're missing out. I know some of the girls who are a bridesmaid for every wedding. It's like, I, was it 27 dresses or something like that? I, I keep buying all these dresses, but not the one I really want. But it's better, it's better to wait. It just is. It's, it, if it's that big of a decision, be patient with it. It shouldn't be spur of the moment. So tonight, if you're not looking for a spouse because you have one, ask yourself, am I being the right one? Have I been focused on developing myself to be beautiful spiritually? Or have I been so caught up in the other things? Uh, am I trustworthy? Do I do what I say? My yes is yes or is my no, no? Uh, am I trustworthy around other people? Am I trustworthy at home, online, at work, around uh, the opposite sex, whatever it may be? Am I being the right one? We're so often focused on what we want in someone else that we fail to look at who we are. I want to find the perfect person, but am I being that person? Perfect person doesn't exist, but I want to find the one. Am I being the one someone's looking for? I hope that helps you tonight in some way or other. I appreciate you paying attention to me. Well, we have like six or seven minutes left, right, I think? 25, 30? I don't know how fast I went. But that's all I got. So I appreciate you paying attention, and we'll take a break, and then we'll be back for a deal. See, now you know where I couldn't, where I got the not how to work a microphone thing from. That was him. That was his mentorship over those three. I'm just kidding. Um, I was paying attention. Yes, I was. Uh, James chapter 5, if you want to turn there just for a moment. We'll read some verses in a second. I'm going to do that preacher thing sometimes where I make a shameless plug. But in October, uh, me and one of my buddies, Parker, are throwing a young adult retreat. So if you know of anyone between the ages of 18 to 30 who would love to spend their fall break weekend listening to some great lessons and singing on a beautiful property, having a lot of fun and meeting other Christians, please ask me for more details after. That's all I'll say about it. But uh, just, you know, any of my kids that I taught in the youth group or anyone just else that you may know of, send them my way. I think it will be a great time. But James chapter 5, I want you to read verse 13 with me. And we'll read this section together. It says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. And then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and earth bore its fruit. And we'll pause right there. I love this passage because what it tells you is in every situation in life, you should pray. Essentially what it tells you. If you're sick and hurting, you should pray. If you are happy, joyful, cheerful, if some great blessings come your way, praise and pray to God. Uh, if you have sin in your life, you should pray. If there's something overwhelming, you should pray. And there's a few reasons why. It tells you that the power of a righteous person's prayer affects much, or it's your faith affects much. Uh, we might think that we're insignificant or that there's not much power to us, but yet he says your faith has great work when you pray. You don't even know. He says Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Elijah wasn't superhuman. He wasn't Hercules. He wasn't some grandiose figure that's different than you. He says he's just like you. When he prayed, God worked. But another great reason that you can pray in every situation is because you have a God that you can tell anything to. And you have a God who can do things far beyond your greatest imagination. I'm thankful when I think about my life that I have a dad on this earth that I really can tell everything to. Handled it with grace. Was always wise, comforting, knew what to say. He 
made an environment for me where I wanted to tell him things because of the way he listened and responded. You and I have a God that we could tell absolutely anything to. That's scary to think about doing it publicly in front of other people. Um, telling them I have a sin, telling them what's really going on in my life, telling them how overwhelmed I am, how I'm, I feel like I'm barely holding it together, and I'm just putting on a face. But yet you have a God that if you talk to him, you'd be amazed at the results. And you have a family here that I'll tell you, while you might be worried they'll think less of you, they'll actually think, I'm right there with you. And they'll say, I love you, and you're not alone. And tonight, you might have plenty of needs, but if you specifically have a need of you are overwhelmed, you're hurting, or you're guilty and you need help, and you want people to know and to be right with him, if we can help you with that by praying with you and hugging your neck, we would love to right now as we stand and as we sing.